Okay. We are going to pick up where uh, we left off at in locking up our own. Uh, though we do not know the precise uh, sentence or page in which they stopped, we do have a general. Uh, we do have a general overall feeling. They made it at least to chapter two, so let's pick up right in chapter two. All right. Damn, I'm so thirsty. Y'all should know that. What? What happened? He said three. Start, Terry started reading chapter three. Rabbit Red. Terry, Terry started reading chapter two. And Rabbit also read. So they into chapter three. Okay. You said three? Y'all put the number three, the, the sign up for the number three too? Okay. I wish it was another camera on the opposite side to see if that was true. Okay, we're on page 78, chapter 3. It's the first time I'm being alerted to this. Uh, chapter 3. <coughs> Man, need some pancakes. Chapter 3, repre oh, some water. Chapter three representatives of their race. The rise of African-American police. Ugh. Ugh, yuck. All right, I don't mean to react like that. It's just because I'm just thinking about it. Was a it was an African American police officer, two African American police officers that participated in the shenanigans that took place outside of uh, Say Their Name Square today, and so it just rubs me the wrong way. <clears throat> On September seventh, nineteen seventy six, more than sixty law enforcement executives representing twenty four states. 55 major cities and approximately 10 million black Americans gathered at the Twin Bridges Marriott Hotel outside Washington, D.C. for a conference on reducing crime in low-income urban areas. The topic itself was unremarkable. Discussion of crime were a staple of the era. But something else about this meeting was special. All the principal attendees were black. It was the first ever national summit of black police executives. D.C.'s assistant police chief, Bartel Jefferson, had worked as hard as anyone to make this gathering possible. Jefferson was the highest ranking black officer in the district's Metropolitan Police Department. In two years, he would be named chief and would assume command of a force that was well on its way to becoming the nation's first majority black urban police department. Jefferson was a modest man with a thin mustache, close cropped hair, and Bible at hand. He reminded me of some church elder. But on this day, he and his rising generation of fellow black police leaders would allow themselves a sense of accomplishment. For most of American history, Police departments have been almost entirely white. This was no accident. Police officers, after all, can take your liberty or even your life. Putting such awesome power in black hands seemed preposterous to most whites who believed that a primary police function was to control blacks. None, none of this was lost on black Americans. James Baldwin spoke for many when he wrote in 1960 that the white policeman walks through the ghetto like an occupying soldier in a bitterly hostile country. Okay, I want to take a uh, note of that. So that's uh, 1960 that James Baldwin wrote that. And here we uh, stand in 2021, 61 years later. And if you go into the and if you go to fairgrounds, you see a police district right there in front of it. Uh, you go to uh, <clears throat> you go near Black Hawk and you see a police district right there, right near in front of it. Uh, I believe they build a uh, I don't know the uh, name of the uh, the complex that they build over on the east side, but it's a police district right there next to that. You go into these neighborhoods, these uh, neighborhoods that have demographics that are majority black, and you see the the amount of police officers, uh, the amount of police activity that regular occurs there. And so the same amount of people who do drugs on the west side of Rockford is the same amount of people who do drugs on the east side of Rockford. The difference in the reason why, the reason that it's more arrest in certain areas is because of the occupation by these. Uh, uh, by these fascist police officers in those areas. And so as we read through the, again, I want people, this is Locking Up Our Own, Locking Up Our Own by James Foreman, Ju James Foreman Jr. Go uh, Google, uh, whatever manner in which you need to uh, get a hold of this book, go and get a hold of this book. And I want you to cross-reference these things as you are reading them. And so in 1960, this is how black people were feeling about the police department. And here we are in 2021 and ain't nothing changed. In light of this history, a room full of black police leaders was an undeniably powerful symbol. But a question loomed over the gathering. Now that policing's long-established color line had been breached, what would happen to criminal justice policy? 
How would black chiefs and black officers be different from their white predecessors? A symbolic victory had been won, yes, but the practical consequences of that victory were far from clear. As far back as the 1860s, black Americans have been calling for the hiring of black police officers. This was an essential, if forgotten, part of our nation's civil rights struggle. But while these demands were consistent, the rationales were not. Some advocates claimed that blacks would make better crime fighters. They would win black citizens trust more easily, could more effectively cultivate informants in black communities, and, above all, would be more motivated to protect black lives. This final consideration was especially significant to those who have suffered the consequences of white indifference to crime, vice, and public disorder in black communities. Others said that black officers would be less abusive and disrespectful than their white counterparts. Unencumbered by racism, they'd be less likely to harass innocent blacks or use excessive force during stops or arrests. Instead of treating all blacks as suspects, they would be able to distinguish decent folks from the criminal element. Still, other advocates focused on economics. Police jobs were good jobs with decent pay and even better benefits. And blacks should get their fair share of the pie. Finally, some argued that investing blacks with the power of a badge and a gun would send a vital message to Americans on both sides of the color line, overturning a tradition of white resistance to the very idea of black authority. In retrospect, it's not hard to see how these rationales might conflict in practice. To take the most obvious example, and the one that would eventually present itself the most forcefully, the desire for more vigorous policing might prove incompatible with the goal of less police harassment. Okay, so I want people to think about that concept. That's why we read, that's, this is the, the purpose in which we are reading these books. I go through, when I read things a lot, I highlight things. Uh, these are the purpose in which we are reading these books, uh, is to get, to think about, to, uh, to use some type of critical thinking uh, for some of these words uh, that are put in here and then try to apply those to practice in, our, uh, in the struggle that we are in. And so <clears throat> people should take note of this. To take the most obvious example and the one that would eventually present itself most forcefully, the desire for more vigorous policing might prove incompatible with the goal of less police harassment. And that brings us to the new Jim Crow. And the end of, end of policing, where in both of these books, they speak about the increase in police. They speak about the increase in jails and in, in the prison industrial complex. And so even though they're in here, they are speaking about the desires that people in the black community have uh, had. And again, we are not into a revisionist history. We are not into denial uh, or, or respectability politics or or any of the things that uh that do not uh, uh, that do not embrace full transparency, and so we can fully uh, read this book and understand that it were black it was black people uh, clamoring for black police officers. It were black people clamoring for uh, more police officers. It was black people clamoring for police officers to do something about crime in neighborhoods. But that did not start in 2021. That did not start in 2010 or in 2000 or in 1990 or in 1980 or in 1970 or in 1960. We are reading right here where they talk about. Uh, what they're talking about as far back as the 1860s, they were asking for more uh, black police officers uh, because of the because of the lack of a desire for white police officers to solve crimes in these neighborhoods. Now, that is the same issue that we face in the day, even though police, uh, some of these police departments became integrated and then they increased the police officers and increased the police department. It did not uh, so it did, because they did not ever have a, a true uh, desire to stop some of these issues, increasing these police officers did not stop crime or stop murders or stop these some of these violent tendencies that society has perpetuated on the people instead it only invited more police harassment because now they have more powers because now it's more of them now they have more equipment now they have more funding and then that gets us to uh they can't kill i'm mean, excuse me to the end of policing in the new jim crow so uh we need to understand that so when people rebut with the eye with the response uh well black people wanted more police officers uh black people asked for more police officers uh black people ask for police officers to be black yes they did ask for those things but when was those things asked for when was those things desired so here we go uh but for a century no one recognized the potential for such conflicts as long as the hiring of black officers remained a distant dream hold on let me see one second let me see something one second as long as hiring of black officers remained a distant dream a distant dream Dream. There was no way to test any theory about the changes they would bring to law enforcement. By 1976, however, 
America City had appointed enough black police executives to fill a symposium and had hired thousands of additional thousands of additional black police executives in rank and file positions. One second. You just don't never know. I gotta really do dual a dual live. Hello, how you doing today? Doing all right, sir. If there's anything we can help you with, let us know. Okay. All right. Thirsty. Okay. Uh, by 1976, however, America cities had appointed enough black police executives to fill a symposium and had hired thousands of additional blacks in rank and file positions. As a result, the question of what difference black people, black police would or could make was suddenly urgent. With heroin and firearms swapping black America, crime on the march, and concerns about police abuse undiminished, the new black police officers faced extraordinary pressure to have a transformative impact. The emergence of black police leaders in the 1970s did more than present new questions. It also signified the arrival of new voices to answer them. For decades, civil rights leaders, preachers, and the black press have made the case for hiring black police officers. They have made bold claims about what these officers would do once they achieve significant representation on the force. But of course, these advocates were not police officers themselves and had no intention of joining the police. Meanwhile, far from public view, Bartel Jefferson and his colleagues had long battled intense on-the-job discrimination in Jim Crow police departments. For 20 30, even 40 years, they had endured untold indignities and overcome impossible odds. Now they, were at, now they were at or near the top of a profession that was finally preparing to allow them, at least some of them, to assume leadership positions. Few people have bothered to ask these black police officers what they would do if they were in charge. Now the nation, especially as cities with large black populations, would find out. In 1948, Bartel Jefferson was a young man who needed a job. Born in D.C. in 1925 and educated in the city's segregated school system, he had graduated from Armstrong Technical High School six years earlier. Founded in 1902, Armstrong reflected the philosophy of Booker T. Washington, who in a speech at his dedication declared, all forms of labor, whether with the head or with the hand, are honorable. Though Armstrong offered college prep classes, it couldn't compete on that score with D.C.'s legendary Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar High School. Dunbar was probably the most prestigious black high school in the nation under Jim Crow and the undisputed school of choice for the city's black elite. In contrast, Armstrong built his reputation on vocational training, sending his graduates into careers such as shoe repair, painting, and dressmaking. Armstrong didn't prepare students to be police officers. Considering the history of race and policing, that is hardly surprising. Many of the first police forces in the South were founded as slave patrols, explicitly charged with catching, beating, and returning runaway slaves. After the Civil War, slave patrols ended, and at least officially, uh, at least officially, the job of controlling and repressing, uh, repressing blacks continued under a new division of labor. The police would enforce Jim Crow vagrancy laws and nighttime curfews and the dirtier assignments, including lynching, cross burning and night riding were left to the vigilante groups such as Ku Klux Klan. Still, the Klan and the police often work together, their rosters commonly consisting of the same people. Some sheriffs not so secretly traded their badges for rubs at sundown. To blacks, the, the continuities between these forms of repression were obvious. As one black man in North Carolina recalled decades after slavery had ended, slave patrols have been just like policemen, only worse. Okay, so I just want to uh, uh, I just want to take some time out to uh, speak about that passage there. So again, uh, for people who may not have known it, I think that when people ask about uh, uh, when people talk about uh, the policing and the reasons that we feel that we need to change this system, uh, we need to understand that uh, the uh, many of the first police forces in the South were founded as slave patrols, explicitly charged with catching, beating, and returning runaway slaves. That is the exception of the majority of the police departments in, uh, in policing in this country. Uh, the job of controlling and repressing, repressing blacks continued under a new division of labor. The police would enforce Jim Crow vagrancy laws and nighttime curfews and the dirtier assignments, including lynching, 
cross burning and night riding were left to vigilante groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. And now people should understand that this is not something that happened a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. I have an 82 year old grandfather who understands what Jim Crow vagrancy laws were like, who understands what nighttime curfews were like, who lived in Mississippi, who understands what lynching and cross burning and night ridings were like. And so people try to speak about these things or like to speak about these things like they are completely foreign uh, to the society that we live in now. Excuse me completely foreign to the society that we live in now, and that is just completely untrue. There are still people who participated in Ku Klux Klan vigilante Jim Crow justice that are alive today, who, uh, who, who are uh, espouting that type of philosophy to their children and to their grandchildren, and those things are still being perpetuated through generations. So we cannot become stagnant and uh, allow ourselves to think that this is something that is over or something that happened in the past and something that no longer resonates or reflects on the issues that we face on a day-to-day basis. During Reconstruction, when blacks gained the right to vote and hold office, they also joined Southern police forces for the first time. But, as with much of the progress made during Reconstruction, the victory was short-lived. The very thought of black officers were both infuriating and ter terrifying to a society that demanded black, sub that s demanded black subservience and feared retaliation for the violence of slavery. When city leaders in Raleigh, North Carolina, had hired four black officers in 1868, the Daily Sentinel responded with headlines proclaiming, The Mongrel Regime, Negro Police. Readers were warned that this is the beginning of the end. Whites in Jackson and Meridian, Mississippi, rioted when newly appointed black officers tried to do their jobs. Perhaps it was Mississippi Congressman Ethel Burt Barksdale who best summed up the prevailing Southern view. The existence of black officers would imply domination over whites, and the white man is not used to being dominated by the colored race. When forces hostile to Reconstruction took over state governments and began instituting Jim Crow segregation, black officers provided an early target. As the historian W. Marvin Dulaney concludes, by 1910, African Americans had literally disappeared from Southern police forces. By that time, although 47.5 percent of the nation's black population lived in South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Alabama, there was not a single black officer in those states. The situation was barely better in border and northern states, where the vanishingly few black officers lived a second-class existence. 105,000 Negro citizens rate at least one Negro. 105,000 Negro citizens rate at least one Negro police. Protester, Atlanta, Georgia, 1946. Blacks wanted the right to serve as police officers just as badly as white supremacists wanted to deny it to them. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, national civil rights groups surveyed police departments in an attempt to document the number of black officers and to show that cities had higher black officers were happy with the results. And show that cities that had higher black officers were happy with the results. Local civil rights advocates used this information to push for change in city after city. In Atlanta, for example, Civil rights groups, religious leaders, and the city's largest black paper, the Atlanta Daily World, joined forces in a decade-long campaign to bring about the hiring of black officers. Atlanta's wasn't the only such campaign, but perhaps because the city had a large black middle class, rivaling D.C.'s in size, the fight for black officers in Georgia's capital won exuberant coverage from the nation's black press. Atlanta advocates based their case on the theory that black police officers would fight crime more effectively. Why does the high murder rate among Negroes in Atlanta continue unabated? Asked the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, CIC, a group that brought together Southern white liberals and conservative blacks, some of whom were associated with Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. After hosting a series of gatherings in 1936 that included some of Atlanta's most prominent blacks, the CDC issued a report blaming elevated black crime in part on the laissez-faire attitudes of white police and white jurors in case uh, in cases where Negroes kill Negroes. In such cases, the report said murderers have been known to get off with two and three years and in some cases with six months. White police were not only indifferent to black suffering, they were abusive in work and manner. Uh, white police were not only indifferent to black suffering, they were also abusive in word and manner toward black citizens. This caused a vicious cycle. Black citizens often refused to cooperate with police, with STEMI black police investigations, half-hearted to begin with, leaving blacks yet more vulnerable. This depiction of the problem, dispiritingly similar in many respects to accounts of the dysfunctional relationship between police departments and black communities today, led the group to call for hiring black police. Okay, let me, uh, I want to go into, into that portion right there. Uh, 
After hosting a series of gatherings in 1936 that included some of Atlanta's most prominent blacks, the CIC issued a report blaming elevated black crime in part on the laissez-faire attitudes of white police and white jurors in cases where Negroes kill Negroes. Okay, so I think that we should go and trace back where this is, uh, statement is coming from. This is a statement being made in 1936. And so, in 2021, we can no longer afford to, uh, uh, to continue to address this uh, argument or address this uh, issue uh, as posing it as a, how do we stop, uh, as they put it here, Negroes killing Negroes? Or what is the reason that Negroes are killing Negroes? Or what's the reason that it's violence in black communities or in, in, in some of these communities that are predominantly black? Uh, and this is something that I've said regularly and I've heard other people say regularly. So this is not like a, a concept that I've came up with myself. But violence, not only do we live in a society that uh, perpetuates violence, uh, but Violence has been shifted and put in certain areas and not only just allowed and enabled to happen in those areas, but have had a uh, government uh, complicit complicity in having these things done. Uh, cocaine was brought into this country uh, uh, and during the 80s, during the crack epidemic, uh, in coordination with the government. Uh, via, during Vietnam, heroin was being brought into this country uh, in coordination with the government. Uh, guns were uh, have been bought into and put in inner communities, excuse me, in coordination with the government. You can go through and Google right now uh, corrupt police officers or corrupt police departments or police officers arrested for corruption. And even though you're, we are uh, the majority of them do not get arrested and do not get prosecuted, you can see a plethora of them who have the Rampart scandal in L.A. is a known thing. Uh, I think L.A. just put out a story to us a couple of weeks ago where they said they excuse me they know that there are gangs within the Excuse me, within the LAPD. And so we have to get to a place where we start understanding that the police, the, the increasing of the police officers and the increasing of the police department, uh, these things, these things happening help to perpetuate the situations that we are in now. And these things have been happening for a hundred, over a hundred years in black communities, over a hundred years. Uh, and then let's go here. Uh, white police were not only indifferent to black suffering, they were also abusive in word and manner toward black citizens. Uh, something I just experienced uh, today when they was tearing down the memorials. Uh, and it's things that we've experienced multiple times. People always talk about uh, the language at certain demonstrations around these things. What people fail to understand is some of the language that the, these police officers use and that these police officers have used for generations uh, on communities. Uh, and so uh, this caused a vicious cycle. Black citizens often refuse to cooperate with police, with stymie police investigations, half-hearted to begin with. And that's, that's, that, that is in 1936 that these things are being stated and being half-hearted uh, to begin with, leaving blacks yet more vulnerable. This description of the problem, dispiritingly similar in many respects to accounts of the dysfunctional relationship between police departments and black communities today, led the group to call for hiring black police. So for anybody who might think that the way to solve this or to fix this issue is hiring more black police officers, they tried that already. Two black police officers participated in the, in the, uh, the Gestapo tactics that took place uh, outside of City Hall this morning. Registering the concerns of Atlanta's black elite, the CIC also argued that black police officers would be capable of distinguishing among classes and types of blacks, a skill that white officers conspicuously lacked. Atlanta was home to many upstanding black citizens, but white officers either couldn't or wouldn't appreciate the difference. Some white officers have no regard for the social standing of colored men or women, the CIC complained. They use the same language to them, that is, to those of higher standing, as they do in the presence of gamblers and known harlots. Colored police, by contrast, would recognize social distinctions. Just as important as they would have more respect, just as important, they would have more respect for their women. And this treatment would have a reciprocal effect with black officers receiving more respect from the race. The case for black police expanded as the Atlanta movement gave strength. In November 1937, the city's branch of the NAACP circulated a pamphlet titled, Wanted, Negro Police for Negro Districts in Atlanta. 
describing black neighborhoods as overrun by crime, lacking adequate public housing and recreational facilities, and resentful of the police, the pamphlet offered three reasons to hire black police officers. They could interpret Negro problems and Negro people, they would be more effective in enforcing the law without violence, and they would inspire community members to view the police more positively. Uh, things that we all know uh, now that are, were not, did not turn out to be factual. By 1947, the Daily World was calling the lack of black police the city's top civil rights issue. The Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. was among the leaders of the campaign to change the city's policy. On September 20th, 1947, King urged the crowd at Morehouse College's Sale Hill Chapel to continue to fight. With his son, then a Morehouse Sr., almost certainly in attendance, King said that only persistent pressure would remedy the injustice of having a community of 100,000 blacks without a single black police officer to represent them. He eschewed waiting, just as his son would 15 years later in letter from Birmingham jail. As the Daily World noted, King exhorted the young people to organize and work toward this end, saying that nothing comes through waiting. Two months after King's speech, with pressure mounting, the Atlanta City Council had no choice but to confront the issue. At a meeting in November 1947, which the Daily World called a heated, rip-roaring session that lasted three hours, King told the council that the time and the hour for Negro police had come. As he had done in Morehouse, he argued that the city's black community deserved to be represented on the police force. Taxation without representation is not right. Other speakers, including the editor of the Daily World, C.A. Scott, returned to the CIC's argument from 1936 and said that black police will reduce crime. Okay, and then uh, let's uh, cross-reference this again to issues and things that we're facing in Rockford, Illinois, in these current moments. And so let's ask ourselves, uh, when did the first black police officers uh, uh, enter the Rockford Police Department? Uh, what was the process in which they entered the Rockford Police Department in? What type of uh, ingratiation did they have when they entered the Rockford Police Department? Uh, how many of them at a time entered the Rockford Police Department? What type of discrimination did they face while in the Rockford Police Department? And the reason that we must ask ourselves these questions is so that way we can show our children coming up why certain institutions should not be bought into. When you read about uh, the, the hurdles and the hoops and all the things that happen for these people to become police officers, to become a uh, part of the police department, that lets you know right there uh, if that's how, you know, people always talk about the way you, if you start a relationship on a lie, it's doomed to fail. And so this relationship with black police, with black men and black women, with the police department was started on a lie. They were never wanted there. The same thing with, uh, uh, excuse me, the same thing uh, with uh, uh, some of these uh other forms of integration in certain uh, institutions in society. Uh, when you are not wanted in a certain place and in a certain thing, yes, you may be allowed to be in there, but once you get in there, the, the manner in which you can conduct yourself and the manner in which you can exert your power and your leverage is vastly different than somebody who is ingratiated into this institution, who is part of this system. And so we have to understand that it was a time when uh, co black communities and brown communities wanted more police officers and more people that look like them to be on the police force because at the time all they seen was white men as police officers and they thought if black people could fit those fill in those shoes maybe these uh, forms of oppression and exploitation and trauma that I'm experiencing will cease because of their skin that will resonate with my uh with my struggle will resonate with the things that I experience and instead of being uh, uh oppressive in the same nature that a white police officer is they you know they'll think twice or they'll empathize more uh, but we have fat now as you fast forward time, as you use a time machine and you go forward and you see those things did not help. And so it's important to know the history. No, don't wash the history away. Don't act like black people didn't ask for more police officers. Don't act like black people didn't ask to integrate the police department. They did. And then they continued to be denied over and over and over again. And then by the time that they did get part of the into these police departments, uh, the, uh, the, the misconceptions that people had about these people who would become police officers being uh, uh, maybe civil rights activists or, or being people who would go above and beyond for black people, it proved to be untrue. It proved to be that these people were just uh, people who needed a job and would just go along with the system, would just go along with the, every, with the uh, 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 everyday routine of things. And so it's power in us knowing how we got here. So that way when people pose an argument to us, when somebody comes to you and says, well, I think the way that we solve this is with more black police officers, you point them to locking up their own, locking up our own. 
You uh, uh, read, uh, you uh, speak excerpts that you can remember out of here to them from locking up our own. And you explain to them, no, more black police officers in Rockford will not fix this problem, will not fix this issue. And here's why. The resistance from segregationists was fierce. Supporters of Herman Talm Talmadge, Georgia's notoriously racist former governor, came out against hiring black police officers as the members of the Ku Klux Klan. See, look, think about that. That's what some of these relationships started with. And if you think that the Ku Klux Klan wasn't coming out here in Illinois or don't have a strong presence in Illinois and wasn't trying to be uh, uh, subversive to uh, uh, police officers becoming black in this uh, uh black people becoming uh, police officers and being in that institution and be get, being given some form of power, you out your mind. Uh, echoing Congressman Barksdale's rhetoric from 60 years before, Georgia's Commissioner of Agriculture, Tom Linder, declared that one race must dominate the other. Former Atlanta Mayor Walter A. Sims argued that hiring black police officers was pointless since whites would never obey blacks. If a white man saw a red traffic signal and a Negro policeman nearby, he would just run the red light. Two weeks later, on December 1st, 1947, the city council met again, this time with a resolution on the table that would require Atlanta's police department to hire eight black officers. More than a thousand whites crowded the chamber to oppose the measure. But despite their vehement protestations, the campaign led by Scott and King finally succeeded. The council voted 10 to 7 in favor of the resolution. The Daily World held this passage with the headline, The Long-Awaited Dream Comes True. And yet, the new black officers would be far from equal. The resolution stipulated that they were to be hired on a trial basis, that they would work out of a separate precinct, the basement of the local YMCA, and that they would patrol only in black neighborhoods, and that they would not be permitted to exercise police powers over whites. If a black officer witnessed a white person committing a crime, he could detain the offender, but for an arrest, he'd have to call his supervisor and request that a white officer come to the scene. And so I want people to understand, again, we are speaking about, yes, this is something that they're uh, using Atlanta as an example, but you could, these things are microcosms. Uh, these, these things are microcosms for the tenor and the, of the society at this time. In 1947, they was telling black people that if you're gonna be police officers, Fine, you can be a police officer. You can only arrest black people. And if you see somebody white doing something wrong, you can try to detain them. But you got to get a, a white person to come down there and arrest them. And so right then, right then, uh, the facts, the proof was being shown to you that they had that there was no desire for any type of equity in the beginning of this relationship. OK, so let's let's go back two weeks later. Oh, no, no, no. And yet the new black officers would be far from. E oh, no, no, no. These restrictions were not atypical. All over the country, black officers were, were routinely and systematically humiliated in order to remind them of their second class status and to reassure whites that the racial order remained fundamentally intact. In Savannah, in Savannah, oh damn, see, it's not good. Damn, where I'm at. In Savannah, for example, black officers were not allowed to wear their uniforms to or from work. In Montgomery, Alabama, they had to go around to the back door of the police station to pick up and turn in their equipment each day. Segregation was most thorough in Miami, which until 1962 operated two completely distinct criminal justice systems, one for whites and one for blacks. The latter system had black officers, a black-only police station, and a black judge and bailiff. Miami. So that's 1962. Even in 1962, Florida was fucking nuts. Uh, despite the restrictions, uh, excuse me, the, despite the restrictions, Atlanta's black community rejoiced. The new officers were crowned the Atlanta eight and became instant celebrities. Even before they were sworn in, crowds of black Atlantans gathered to see them in training. Hundreds more, including King, crammed in the greater Mount Calvary Baptist Church to welcome them to active duty. Crowds spilled into the church's basement, annex and balcony, and finally onto the streets outside. The list of speakers was long, from the flower back from the flower bedecked rostrum, speaker after speaker, both Negro and white, delivering st stirring remarks and glorification of the city's hiring of Negro officers. When Mayor William Hartsfield spoke, he told the officers that they carried a special burden. You are more than just policemen, he said. You are going out as the first representatives of your race in Atlanta. Your success is my success and the success of the city council, the chief, your race and the city at large. Invoking the Georgia native Jackie Robinson, who had broken baseball's color line the previous season, 
Hartsfield urged the Atlanta Eight to do the kind of justice, do the kind of job that Jackie did in Brooklyn. But what about the officers themselves? What did they think of the moment? What were their plans for policing? Nobody knew, save for a brief response by one of the men on the group's behalf. According to the Daily World, he praised his superiors for their manner of cooperation. The Atlanta Eight were silent. And so uh, I think that it's important to uh, uh, see where they pointed out and uh, spoke about Jackie Robinson. So we can even look at uh, we can look at all of these different institutions, whether they be uh, sports, whether they be politics, uh, whether they be uh, uh, in government jobs. And you can see how uh, to this day, uh, black people and brown people still deal with exploitation and oppression in these institutions still, even though they've been integrated into some of these institutions and at different uh, at different percentages in each one. They still face some of these same things. So let's think about they talking about the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, which is sports. Let's take it to basketball. So the uh, it was a time where basketball was segregated. Uh, it was integrated. It was integrated uh, in the, the athletes who dealt with that integration, dealt with uh, un, untold traumas and untold type of uh, racist uh, bigotry and issues. You have to listen to some of these athletes talk about the discrimination and the, the racism and the, the slurs that got uh, spoken to them and said to them and the things they had to deal with while they were playing sports. Even though even as they became even once they became integrated, I mean, excuse me, especially once they became integrated into these sports, the things Jackie Robinson. Robinson went through was horrible. The things Hank Aaron went through, the things uh, Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar went through when uh, and, uh, Muhammad Ali went through, these things were horrible. Uh, even though they became integrated into this, uh, the, this society's systems and institutions. And we can see how they dealt with those things then in the beginning of being integrated into those institutions and fast forward to now and see the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers uh, talking to uh, having uh, conversations with uh, complete racist overtones with concrete complete bias and prejudice and bigoted overtones and thinking that it's OK, even though his players are black, even though the majority of his players are black, the majority of people who come watch the game are still white. The majority of the people who uh, who uh, make profit off of the game are still white. The people who make the majority of the profit off of the game are still white. So even though these black people have been integrated into this athletic institution, they still have to deal with the oppression of the institution, the exploitation of the institution, the dehumanization of the institution. And so just simply being integrated into something does not automatically fix it. And that's pointed out right there. So when we are reading these things and when we're reading about the, uh, the uh, all of these issues that may have happened in other cities that aren't Rockford or in other states that aren't Illinois, what we have to do is be able to cross-reference that information and understand that the, this mindset of this society it resonates in all types of cities, resonates in all types of counties, in all types of states. You cannot just separate them. Okay. Okay. Uh, as America's black news outlets trumpeted the arrival of the Atlanta 8, Bartel Jefferson weighed his career options. After graduating from Armstrong, he had entered the Army, serving in the Philippines and New Guinea in World War II. Honorably discharged, he had returned to D.C. and enrolled in Howard University School of Engineering. But even after receiving some limited benefits from the GI Bill, he had found it difficult to make ends meet, and he left school after less than two years. The prospects for a black man in D.C. were bleak, and Jefferson knew it. A year earlier, in 1948, President Truman had established a commission to investigate the state of race relations in the nation's capital. The commission's report was damning. If a Negro stops in Washington, with very few exceptions, he was refused service at downtown restaurants, he may not attend a downtown movie or play, and he has to go into the poorer section of the city to find a night's lodging. The Negro who decides to settle in the district must often find a home in an overcrowded, substandard area. He must often take a job below the level of his ability. He must send his children to the inferior public schools set aside for Negroes and entrust his family's health to medical agencies which give inferior service. In addition, he must endure the countless daily humiliations that the system of segregation imposes upon the one-third of Washington that is Negro. No facet of American life was exempt from the stranglehold of racism. The city even held separate children's marbles competitions, crowning one white and one colored champion. In marbles, as was the rule with Jim Crow, separate was never equal. When the city selected its representative for national competitions, only the white champion was considered. The social effects of segregation were devastating, but the policy's most enduring impact was economic as generations of black citizens were trapped on the bottom rungs of the occupational ladder. Every sector of the economy was implicated, not just racist employers. For example, 
the unions that controlled many of the best trade jobs, including those representing brickmakers and electrical workers, either excluded blacks outright or kept them in segregated locals that received inferior assignments. So impenetrable were the walls excluding blacks from skilled labor jobs that even the tiniest cracks were cause for celebration. In the 1950s, for example, when three black high school graduates, just three, were accepted into apprenticeship training programs, an announcement was made at that commencement, eliciting joyful cheers from an audience of 600 parents. In October 1958, the Afro trumpeted another breakthrough. The D.C. government was undertaking a new construction project and had hired, among dozens of contractors, a single black electrician. The federal government was an equally strict enforcer of segregation. One of the worst offenders was the State Department, which promoted American brand democracy abroad while restricting blacks in the nation's capital to job categories such as chauffeur, messenger, and janitor. Even when blacks gained a toehold in entry-level positions, a caste mentality dominated. One white official recalled how hard it was to integrate the department's typing pool. After a great deal of effort, the typing pool finally agreed to take a couple black typists. Two or three days later, I asked the pool supervisor how things were coming, and she replied that she had solved the problem completely, that everything was going beautifully. I asked her what she had done, and she showed me a screen in one corner of the big room behind which the two, co behind which the two colored girls were sitting. Damn. Okay, let me read that again. Uh, this is how somebody uh, fixed the problem at a, a, the typing pool department of, a, of it being integrated. After a great deal of effort, the typing pool finally agreed to take a couple black typists. Two or three days later, I asked the pool supervisor how things were coming, and she replied that she had solved the problem completely, that everything was going beautifully. I asked her what she had done, and she showed me a screen in one corner of the big room, behind which the two colored girls were sitting. So that was the way that she solved the problem. She hid the black people that got sent to, the, uh, to that room. And so, oh, let me see something. My fault, y'all. One second. And so, as Jefferson prepared to enter D.C.'s apartheid job market, he had few palatable options. As he explained, the only fields of financial stability available to, available to me were teaching the United States Postal Service, and the Fire and Police Departments. When he joined the police force, he was not making a political statement in keeping with the passionate campaign of Scott and King down in Atlanta. By his own account, he was far more concerned with making a decent living. Of the fields open to him, he felt that policing would be the most challenging. We'll beat them at their own game, MPD officer Bartell Jefferson quoted. After World War II, with the struggle to end legally mandated school segregation well underway and the United States seeking to protect the positive image of democracy during the early years of the Cold War, uh, the early years of the Cold War, it would no longer do to blatantly prohibit blacks from getting jobs and promotions in the police department of the nation's capital. But that doesn't mean the system suddenly became, became egalitarian. Instead, as formerly discriminatory policies were erased from the MPD's book, a new system of informal, under-the-table discrimination was implemented in its place. This new system achieved nearly the same results, but through subterfuge and misdirection. So to say that policing was a possibility for Jeff Jefferson does not mean that the job was easy to get. From the moment a black applicant arrived to take MPD's battery of written, physical, and oral exams, the scrutiny was severe. It was extremely difficult for Negroes to get on the force, recalled Owen Davis, another black officer from that era. Many blacks were blocked out of contention because of an ingrown toenail, that kind of thing. What could we do about it? Not much. Davis, like Jefferson, cited limited job opportunities elsewhere as his reason for joining the force. Though he had never wanted to be a police officer, the job paid almost twice as much as his job making mail bags at the post office and it had better retirement benefits. And so we need to uh, listen and understand the mindset of some of these people that are becoming police officers. Uh, that is an, an important thing to do. You're hearing the mindset of these black men as they become police officers, not because they want to do better in the community, not because they want to change individuals' lives, not because they want to, uh, to uh, 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 focus on black liberation or black struggle or black pride or empower black people. They need a paycheck, and this got the best paycheck. 
That's what they come into their job to do. So when they come into so these the first set of people who was getting them badges and those guns and that, with black skin was not coming there to help liberate black people. Was not coming there to try to stop black police or stop police harassment from black people or to stop the amount of crime black people dealt with. They was coming there to get paid. They was coming there for the benefits that the job had. And they was going to that job because even though they may have been overqualified, it should have been able to be doctors or lawyers, maybe not doctors and lawyers, but should have been able to uh, do something else with their life. Uh, they weren't allowed to do those things because they black skin kept them from getting those job opportunities. So that's important to remember, too. Think about the psychology. You see this. We got it. We got to do this thing, too, where we have we really dissect uh, moments in time and dissect uh, how the society and the culture got to a certain place. So think about this now. You got these uh, black men who have been denied, who have uh, who have dealt with uh, uh, living with racism, whose parents and, and grandparents uh, dealt with the uh, Reconstruction and then slavery. Some of these, the, in 1940, some of the 1940, 1950, uh, black men trying to be police officers had grandparents who were who probably who were slaves more than likely. So that trauma is still there with them. That psychological uh, trauma has not been removed, okay? And then now when they go out into the world, every time they go out into the world, they're reminded that they're black and that they're less than. So they can't get the jobs that they really want. They can't live where they really want. They can't uh, do the things that they really want. And so they got to deal with that type of psychological trauma and that type of psychological, uh, those type of psychological uh, burdens, okay? And then they become police officers, okay? And then in the police department, they face, face that same discrimination, face those same hindrances and now they go out into uh areas and neighborhoods and they have power and they uh have someone that that they are more powerful than and they see these people who who nobody cares about what they do to them and now they have people that they can let those things out on they have an outlet to let all of that trauma and that anger and that pain out on and so now they get put into these black communities with all of this trauma with all of this pain with all of these things that have been burdened onto them and then they put those things and then they uh enforce those things onto the black people in these communities that they policing and then and that's how that cycle perpetuates and begins that's the beginning relationship of black people with uh black police officers with black communities and with black police officers that is the beginning of the relationship think about that think about that and now understand why having more black police officers will not fix this problem because the, they tried to do it and the and the beginning of it uh it started uh negatively And so we have to dissect these things, you know, don't just run. We, we you know, we want to we want to read through these things. We want to uh, acquire this knowledge, but we want to make sure that we acquire it and we are able to apply it and we are able to use it in conversations and use it in dialogue and use it in theories and use it in ideology and use it in tactics. Oh, damn, I think the battery's finna. All right, I think the battery's finna be locked. I'll change it in a bit. I'll change it. I'm going to go through a few pages still. It's cool. So it ain't bad yet. All right. <clears throat> yeah, what time is it? 8.15? Uh, after World War II, after World War II, with the struggle to end legally mandated school sec... Ah, fuck. It's too annoying. Damn it. I got to do it. All right, I got to end it. Damn.